Okay, perfect. Again, the idea here is that you want to visualize your image classifier. One way to visualize, and this is really nice because your neural networks are now dreaming about goose. This is a beautiful picture, but how did you come up with this? This is the idea of class model visualization. What do you do? You look at the score of a particular class, in this case, goose, for some image, for some input. And that's going to give you the score. And this is the score before pushing it through a softmax. So these are not probabilities yet. They don't add up to one. They are not necessarily positive or less than one. So these are the inputs to your uh, softmax, which are then going to give you your probabilities. So you're going to look at your scores. And then the idea is find the image that's going to maximize the score for a goose, for a particular class. And then you have flexibility. This image here doesn't have to be part of your data. This could be any image, any tensor that uh, this optimization process is going to come up with. But then you regularize it a little bit so that these images are going to end up being smooth in some fashion. You solve that optimization problem, and then that's going to give you an image. And then you can see perhaps an indication of what the neural network has learned. What is it thinking about? So one of you mentioned, why don't you visualize weights? Actually, two of you. We could do that. And that is actually one of the visualizations that you can find for AlexNet in that paper. But you are going to have a lot of weights, a lot of filters. And then usually the visualizations that you're going to get out of visualizing your weights and biases are not that useful. Visualizations like this are going to tell you what your neural network is thinking about. So there is a concept of goose hidden in the architecture of your neural network, the optimal one. The one that is related to the previous paper about visualization are visualizations like this. For instance, you have a dog here, and then you're visualizing more here. Your neural network is looking more in that area, in that region. How did you come up with this? That's the idea of class saliency visualization. We saw this idea of saliency once more previously when we were doing uh, robustness. And there, the idea was which pixel to change to make your neural network make a mistake, to force your neural network to make a mistake. Here, we are going to use it differently. You have an image. You have the corresponding class. So you need a pair of image and class. And then you're going to take a look at this score before the softmax. And then you're going to expand it in a Taylor series expansion and only keep the linear terms. Don't keep the higher order terms. And this is a good approximation for images that are in the neighborhood of the image of interest. For instance, this doc. And what is this WC? That's the derivative of your score. This is a scalar with respect to the input image. And previously, we were using this score to tell us what is the importance of this particular pixel for the prediction being a doc. And then we would change it so that uh, your neural network is going to make a mistake and classify this image as a cat. But here we are going to use it differently. And that's basically your WC. It's going to have the same dimension as your image. And once you multiply these two together, that's going to give you a scalar. So this is just a dot product of your weights coming out of your derivatives and your input image. What is the idea? Magnitude of each element of this WC is going to give you how important is this pixel in the corresponding prediction being of class C. But that's good. It has the same size as your image, but you want to visualize it in 2D. What you're going to get out of that is in 3D. It's a 3D tensor. Let's do some modifications on it to be able to visualize this. You have an image. The corresponding WC is going to end up being having the same dimension. What you're going to do is you're going to take a maximum of the absolute value of this WC along the channel dimension. So you're collapsing the channel dimension. So you're collapsing red, green, blue values into a single value. And this is the one that you're going to plot. This is going to have the height and the width of your image. These are values that you can plot as an image. Okay, so far so good. Now you can think, now this is a way of visualizing what your neural network is thinking about. Where is it looking? So there is a question in the chat. So this is a non-binary version of Lime. 
And no, it's not related. So for line, we are looking at uh, super pixels and that we are gonna go through next, later on, maybe this session or next session, but this is different. What you're doing here, you're just looking at it pixel wise. You're saying, what is the importance of this pixel for the corresponding prediction being of this particular class? You are right in the sense that, yes, this is a linear approximation of the scores, or it's a linear model to approximate your nonlinear neural network, uh, but then uh, you're wrong when in line, you care about interpretable super pixels. For instance, you're gonna have a super pixel here, and over there, your linear model is thinking about the presence or absence of your super pixels. So it's a matter of how you featureize. Here, the features for your linear model are just pixels. Does that answer your question? So they are related, but they are not the same. So there is another question. So to do this, we can pick an image of our own choosing of a certain class and then evaluate what the network is looking at exactly. So all you need for this algorithm to work, to be able to visualize, you take an image, you take the corresponding class, and then you are just gonna look at the derivative of that score for that particular class with respect to the image. And then you are gonna be able to visualize it. And uh, the other question is, does this have to be the correct class, the C that you choose? Not necessarily. This doesn't have to be the highest score class. This could be anything and you can visualize it. There is another question. When there is high interclass variation, does this method become more difficult to gain insight from? What do you mean by high interclass variation? Uh, like if you have, like here in this image, it's a small dog, but what if you have a completely different type of dog that looks, looks nothing like this? Uh, would the insights you get from this method on what the network concentrates on change drastically? as opposed to if your data set had all similar looking dogs? Uh, yes, so that matters. The number of class that are coming out of your classifier, it matters. If it is not fine grained to be able to tell apart different breeds of dogs, then no, your neural network is gonna tell you that there is a dog and this is where I'm looking at. Okay, makes sense. One application of this is when you are doing self-driving cars, and then you want to convince your customer that your neural network is looking at the correct location. Is it actually looking at the light when it's crossing an intersection or is it not? Is it looking at the stop sign or not? Is it focusing there or not? And you can show these types of visualizations to your passengers of the self-driving car. That's one application. Another application is what you're seeing here weekly supervised object localization. We are gonna be doing object detection later on in the course, but this is unsupervised, or you can say this is weekly supervised because for instance, for this particular dog, you're just gonna say that the corresponding class is a dog. You're not gonna say that there is a dog in this area or in this bounding box of the region. So the bounding box coordinates are absent from your data set. And this is why this is weekly supervised. And this is impressive, what you're seeing here, being able to locate the dog only from the class. So your neural network is actually doing something interesting. So I'm not gonna go through a lot of details here, but you can have a threshold for this class saliency map. M above that threshold, you can color these points to have a color of blue. Below that threshold, you're gonna say that's a background color it as red and the ones between the lowest threshold and the upper threshold you can say that we are not going to use any color for that so there is blue cyan and red to be more specific these ones that are higher than a given threshold you're going to co color them as a blue the ones below a particular threshold you're going to color them as a cyan those are going to be your background and the ones in between you color them as a red and there is this algorithm, it's a classical uh, computer vision algorithm. It has nothing to do with deep learning. You're gonna apply that. This is gonna be the input to your algorithm. And then it's gonna keep adding pixels in an iterative fashion. And that's gonna help you detect the corresponding bird in this image. And this is useful whenever you want to remove the background and replace it with something else. 
this we do it all the time these days when we do Zoom, our Zoom meetings, we're just removing the background. So one of the applications is removing the background. But I promised that this paper is gonna be related to the DeConvNet paper for visualization. And let's go through that. And that's gonna help us understand the previous paper a little bit more. What is the relationship to the previous method? Let's look at the input to a particular convolution or to a particular layer. It doesn't have to be a convolutional operation. And let's say that's the input to your nth layer. And we know that Xn is gonna end up being a tensor. It's gonna have a height, it's gonna have a width, and it's gonna have a couple of channels. As you go to the next layer, from this layer to the output, you're gonna end up with another set of feature maps, another tensor. You can pick an element from that tensor. That's gonna be a scalar. So F is a scalar, Xn is still a tensor. Now you can take derivatives. You can do back propagation. You can take derivative of F with respect to Xn. Let's do that. And let's say F is coming out of a convolution operation. So you have your input, you convolve it with a kernel, that's gonna give you the output. You take derivative of F with respect to Xn, you do your chain rule, and that's gonna give you the derivative of F with respect to Xn plus one, convolved with some transformations on your convolution kernel. So you're transposing and then flipping left and right. So this one I'm gonna leave as an exercise. What I want you to do is write down the formula for a convolution. You can pick a three by three convolution, expand it fully. So expand everything in terms of scalars. So expand all of your summations and then take its derivative. Take the derivative of something with respect to your axis. Use the chain rule and then you're gonna be able to notice another convolution is coming up. Your summations, you're gonna collapse them into a convolution operation. And as soon as you collapse them, express everything in terms of tensors, you're gonna see that K hat has the same parameters as K, but then they are reshaped. There is some transpose going on and then some flipping left and right. But KN and K have the same numbers in them. And that's the deconvolution operation. That's what you're actually using to do back propagation through a convolution or use deconvolution to do plotting, to do visualization. So KN hat is the flipped version of KN. Same numbers, it's just flipped. But now let's assume you want to go backward. Somebody gives you a feature map and then you want to go backward. You want to do the deconvolution. We are gonna replace this guy by Rn. We are gonna replace this guy by Rn plus one. And then Rn is just Rn plus one convolved with a flipped version of Kn, your kernel. So there is a comment in the chat. I've seen this called cross correlation. To be fully transparent, these are actually not mathematically correct in terms of being convolution. So convolutional neural networks are not actually convolutions. They are actually correlation, cross correlation. But that's what the name that people chose for it. But it's okay. It's not a lie. You don't have to always be mathematically correct. Okay. So let's not be picky. This is how things are going to work. So this is just a convolution. And this is a convolutional layer. I have a typo here. But anyways, this is the operation that we use to go backward from a feature map above. You are going to the feature map below using a deconvolution operation, which is basically a convolution. And to make your life a little bit harder, set the stride to be two. First, start with a stride of one, and then change your stride to be a stride two and see what happens, okay? So, so far it's just the convolution. Then we go ahead and do the ReLU when we were going forward from Xn to Xn plus one. What is the derivative in terms of the chain rule? Derivative of the max function, derivative of your ReLU, ReLU is linear and then zero its derivative is gonna be zero and one. That's why you have this indicator function. Whenever your input is positive, that's what you're using. But here is the catch. Previously, for deconvolution, you were doing this. Rather than having your indicator operating on your input, it was actually operating on the derivatives. It's as if you are putting the derivative of f over the derivative of xn plus one here, being positive. Because remember, Rn plus one is just a derivative of your f with respect to your input, with respect to your x. So that's a variation. So you were asking me in the previous slide about your ReLU. 
And where is that coming from? This is coming from here. Okay, so far so good. And why am I doing this? Because we see some derivatives here to visualize what the neural network is thinking about when it's classifying an image as a particular class. You were looking at derivatives. And those derivatives are actually giving you the previous method line by line with some minor modifications. What's next? You have this max pooling operation. You would look at a region around a particular pixel and then you would compute the maximum value in that region to give you the max pooling. If you do the chain rule here, you know that you're gonna need to store those switches to be able to do back propagation. And these switches, we just saw them. Whenever you are going forward, you're gonna store your switches. Whenever you're going, to back, going backward, you're gonna remember where to put these values. Otherwise it's a zero. So, and that's coming out of a back propagation. So the only approximation that you're doing is here when it comes to your nonlinearity. The rest of it is just back propagation. And the other change from before is that this is an indicator function. The previous paper was using a ReLU when it was going the reverse route, trying to visualize your feature or feature map. And this is gonna be the outcome of that process. And this we saw for a couple of other examples. I think uh, I'm gonna, this is a good time to ask questions before I move on. So when you have the comment where it says slightly different from above, is that um, for this paper? And then the previous line was for the deconv net that we covered previously? Yes. So this is actually the deconv with a ReLU, but then uh, this is a little bit different from doing back propagation, which is this paper. So this line is this paper. This other line is the previous paper. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other ones? So there was mathematical reasoning for why you were doing what you were doing before. It just boils down to taking derivative of that particular activity or that particular feature map with respect to your input image. And we know that that derivative is gonna give you the importance of every single pixel. If you change it this much, how much is that gonna affect your score? 